So if you've never met Julie before, um, she is an incredible human being that is being used by the Lord. Uh, and it started out with a desire to help people in need. Uh, first, let's actually start. Where did you grow up? So I lived in Kansas City until I was in high school. My dad was a pastor, and we moved to Northern California, so up to Redding. And then I came down to Azusa Pacific to study nursing. And while I was in nursing school, there was an opportunity to go on a short-term trip to Kenya. I didn't actually intend to go, but a friend of mine didn't want to go to the information, information meeting by herself, so I told her I would go with her. And then she did not go to Kenya that summer, and I did. <laughs> and then I had an incredible, um, just an incredible experience working alongside Kenyan leaders who were very passionate about the suffering and the well-being of their people. And um, I came back and finished nursing school. I um, decided to work at Cedars Sinai in LA um, in the HIV unit. So I was really, really moved by what was going on in Africa and specifically Kenya because that's where I had traveled um, along um, around HIV. And so I said I wanted to learn more. And so I worked for three years in an HIV unit while I was um, becoming a nurse practitioner. And then in 2004, I moved to Kenya um, for a year, and <laughs> that a, was a year. <laughs> yeah, so that was 19 years ago, and um, <laughs> I've just had the privilege to live my life and um, within a community alongside fellow believers and people who wanted to see God's kingdom come, and they welcomed me to be a part. So, so. Uh, when you went to Kenya uh, almost 20 years ago now, at that time, did you have any idea what the Lord was going to be doing or what has happened now? Did, was that a vision that you had or was it a vision that grew? So I, I went really with the conviction that people shouldn't die alone and that at the time, because of the fear and stigma, because there was no access to testing or treatment for HIV, that's what was happening. And it's not like that I went there thinking that I would be the solution for that, but I felt like I could be a part of this team of growing team of people who wanted to really serve those who were suffering. And so that's what I stepped into. And no, I did not have, I didn't have a vision for what, um, was going to come. Even now, I think I'm, I'm actually really grateful that God didn't give me the whole picture, um, that it's been a step-by-step -step faith journey of trying to be faithful with what's the right next step in front of us, and not always like with certainty, but like watching God lead and practice that step-by-step um, -step has been really the journey. So uh, for people who don't know, we have a video that we could show you to explain what Living Room International is and what they do. Robin, if you want to come play that. And would go on home visits on a regular basis. I would often come across cancer patients or people living with HIV and AIDS who were experiencing all kinds of pain and symptoms that we didn't have access to any kind of pain medication. It just wasn't available, it wasn't affordable, it wasn't something that the patients had any access to. So people were in the villages suffering and it just felt like enough, you know, it doesn't need to be like this. There was a couple of specific cases that that awakened, I think, my heart and my mind to just how extensive the need was. I had gone on two home visits in one day to visit two children. It was with one of our social workers that I was working with at the time. And the first home was of a two and a half year old little girl. And her name was Flovia. She weighed about 12 pounds and she was HIV positive. I found her lying on the floor of this little kitchen. It was a mud hut. She was dying. I was so moved by her, <laughs> by her little life on this floor and thought, 
I think we have to try, we have to do something different than this. So, you know, she was on the verge of starvation and there were, you know, many other contributing factors because of HIV and her being an orphan. But um, I went from her home to a second home of a child who was 14 months old, a little boy, very similar situation, um, HIV positive, again, severely malnourished, and just these little bodies <laughs> and their arms and legs so, so wasted and I just held him in my arms too and asked the question of what does it look like? What does it mean to love in this situation? I came back from those two home visits that day and I sat with David Tarus, who's one of our national leaders and another friend named Allison and we just began to discuss the situation and, and I just remember Allison saying, well, let's try, let's, let's try. And so we created this little treatment center in the clinic with one room and began to feed these babies every two hours. She was really, you could think this child, we were waiting to be called at any time in the middle of the night that she passed away. But there was a secret. I think when you, you give somebody a total attention, and you do what is in your scope and give your heart and attention and focus that person, something happens. And at the end of the day, we call it a miracle. We did that for weeks and weeks. And after six weeks, uh, little Felix, he went into respiratory distress and he, he died very quickly. It was a painful loss because it was one that, you know, we were just, we had so much hope and desire that it would be a different outcome. Um, but we watched Flovia thrive, and she did learn to walk, and she began to speak two languages, and she would call everyone mom, mama. So she would call all the men, all the women, anyone in her life mama, because we were the people who were loving her and taking care of her. After a few months of care, she was able to go to a children's home, and you know, now it's, all these years later and to watch the life that's still in her um, is quite remarkable for me. That experience of taking care of those two children, one that passed away and one that came back to life very much represents what the living room is, where hospice is so often associated only with death and end of life care. I feel like we have a unique opportunity just to provide care that we leave the outcomes <laughs> to God, they're out of our hands, but as far as us doing the best with what we have in this place um, is what Living Room is about. such an incredible thing, what you guys do. Um, and we were kind of joking uh, before service, you know, why are we talking about this? Why aren't we talking about Jesus? <laughs> and uh, one of the things that I love that you've done the past couple times that you've spoken here is that you have a clear understanding of what the gospel is and what it means and how it works. Uh, the gospel is the good news. Of course, it's the good news first about the fact that all of us have sinned and fallen short of God's glory, and that, that sin is deserving of punishment, of death. But God loved us with such a deep and profound love that he sent his one and only son to rescue us from our sin, our sorrow, our shame, and from death. And so when Jesus came, he lived life among us. He touched us, our hearts. He was a physical, living, breathing human being who was the most human human who ever lived. Jesus lived life among us sinless. He became the perfect sacrifice for us, and he laid his life down so that he could show his love to us. Uh, you might remember me talking about one of the best ways to demonstrate the truth of the gospel, uh, or the best way to prove the truth of the gospel is to demonstrate it, to live it out. And that's one of the things I love when you, when you come and speak about living room and what you guys are doing with people. It's the gospel lived out. You're touching the lives of people and giving them a living hope, a new hope. Um, tell us a little bit more about how 
uh, the practicality of living out the gospel allowed living room to grow and thrive? Well, one of the verses that I hold on to really tightly is that um, do not love with words alone, but in action and truth, and then also that the only thing that matters is faith expressing itself in love. And I feel like we, wherever we are in the world, but like in the community that I get to be a part of and in the work of Living Room, we get to live this out every day and we get the opportunity to receive people who are often at their, it's their hardest seasons um, with disease or with loneliness or just with the poverty that often accompanies um, also their disease in this area. And so to be able to show up and to say that everything that we do with love, that that matters to God, it's holy to God. And so if someone comes and they can no longer bathe themselves, then the way that we bathe them, that that is sacred to God. And if someone can't feed themselves and we help to feed them, or if someone is lonely and we remind them, um, just in the ways that we interact with them, that you are loved and worthy of it, that you are not forgotten by God. Like these are the things that I feel like every day, it's now a team of 150 of our staff who are doing it in our two campuses. And you know, it's something that like God put within me and other leaders that we were to be a community of compassion that honors life and offers hope. And in every way that we get to do that, we feel like that's good news. It is the gospel. It is the way Jesus came and moved through this world and interacted with people who so often were on the margins or overlooked or not valued or not seen as valuable within society. Like how do we um, I recently have been thinking about the word respect, and you know, so often I've thought about it as like a way to honor or to, yeah, to honor. And when I really was looking at what the word means, it means to look again. And I feel like one of the things that God has been inviting me and our team to do is, you know, there's the initial scene of something, but so often we can only see the labels or the things that are most visible, but I just feel this invitation of respect to look again, to look deeper, to see in ways that maybe on first glimpse I missed that, that God actually sees. That's awesome. Tell us a little bit more about the, the property, the facilities um, that you guys have been building. Maybe a timeline would be fun too, as sure. to how, how things progressed. So I moved to Kenya, like I said, in 2004, five years into living in Kenya. I was working for a small nonprofit called Empowering Lives International, doing really, really powerful work. And I was so grateful to be a part of a community-based organization doing HIV mobilization. Um, but what God continued to put in my heart was this need for hospice and palliative care services to really be able to serve initially um, the HIV population who were at the end of life and who were often um, alone. And so we started, like the video said, in 2008 is when Flovia and Felix came into our care. So those, those were our initial inpatient um, children. And then within a year, I really felt like we were supposed to start an organization to be able to focus on hospice care. And so we started with an eight bed unit. And then in 2010, we started construction of Kimbulio Hospice. Um, Kimbulio means refuge or a place to run to in Swahili. And so we built a 24 bed inpatient facility for both adults and children, and then continued a com community-based, home-based care program for about 400 families in the community around us. And so that is how we began. Um, and I thought that's, I thought that would be good. <laughs> that would be enough. That would be like what God would ask of us. And I'm, I mean, it's huge. It's huge. Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, I, and I felt, I felt really grateful and content with where God had led us and like stretched also, I think by what our team was doing um, in 2000 and 15 is when our U.S. board, who Pam Malloy is a part of, um, they had come to Kenya and they met with our Kenyan board. And we had been talking about our beds were all full 
And in Eldoret, about an hour's drive away from the village where we were working, um, they had, there was a newly opened cancer center, and they were looking to living room to really help lead the hospice and palliative care aspect of all of these patients that were going to come from all over the country. And so we said, well, let's just begin to look for land so that we could have a second location closer to this larger town, this large hospital and cancer center. And so that was 2015. And um, this is what it's become. But on the same day that we made the decision to look for land, a lady who I had not met before named Kate called. And she said, you know, I got your phone number from this person and my mother-in-law just passed away and we have furniture that we'd like to donate to the, to Kimbulio. And so two days later I went with our director and we drove into this piece of land that I had no idea it, like could exist in the area. Like it's, yeah. it's a large urban city with a lot of concrete and we drove into it and I was like, God, like I know this is not ours, but like, could this be? And so two weeks later, we bought this eight acre piece of property and it is a magnificent garden um, that then we were able over 2016 and 17 to design and construct and it opened in 2019. Now, when we built it, we built it to be a hospice. So we knew how to do hospice. And, I mean, it would be stretched by the number of beds. It was a 49-bed hospi hospice. Um, and then in 2019, when we went to register it, the Ministry of Health said no this needs to be a community hospital. And so we began to <laughs> navigate you what that, that would mean as to be far bigger. as all of the different <laughs> services that it would include. We had 8,000 applications for 60 jobs. And David Tarus, who was in the video, he said someone took the time to apply, so we're going to take the time to read it. So mm -hmm. like, just like this commitment to, towards we wanted to do things with excellence and with compassion. And everything that we had already learned and experienced from Kimbilio, we were praying that God would help us implement into our work here. And then um, so over the last four years of like holding true to what is our vision. Our vision is to be a community of compassion, but then what are the services that God is asking us and the Ministry of Health is asking us? Like, how, how do we think about um, expanding services? And so that's been a big part of our last couple of years of adding general um, inpatient services and outpatient services, having ICU and operating rooms and maternity services and how do we how do we think about creating a hospital and running a hospital holding on to the vision that we don't want to exclude people because they would i mean because of the ability to pay so how do we create a model that's going to work towards sustainability while also allowing us to serve the population who we really believe God allowed us to build this for and so that's what we're working towards it's what every day like we show up and trust that God's heart is guiding us that his kingdom is coming near um that when people come and they think this can't be for me because it's too good like that you know like that's the way god is with us he doesn't give us leftovers and so to be able to work towards that um day in and day out and to have like this remarkable team of kenyans to do it with it's the greatest privilege of my life ah, i just love hearing this <laughs> you know uh why don't you tell us a little bit about, uh, I think this is the most recent development with the Micah House. Tell us about that. So the backstory is that in 2016, our family had a kind of a change of the, the path that we thought we were on. We had our daughter, um, Ella, and then um, there was a baby, a premature baby whose mother had died in childbirth who was brought to the hospice. And um, it's the only time in my nearly 20 years of living in Kenya where I called Titus and I just said, like, I want us to take care of this baby. Not that he was to be ours, but that he was too small. He was too sick. It was not the right place. And so Titus agreed for us to take care of him. Very long story short, six, at six months old, he was di diagnosed with sickle cell disease. He was the youngest 
of eight siblings, and so two of the other siblings who had not yet got diagnosed also, um, like within weeks, had a diagnosis of sickle cell disease, which for context, in Kenya, um, it's between 50 to 90 percent of children with sickle cell disease die by the, before the age of five, and so just like holding the weight of all of that, that they're suffering, what it might look like for our family as we were trying to leave room for God to interrupt our plans and showing us like just the love that he had for these kids. And so they became a part of our family. And then in 2017, while the hospital in Eldoret was being built, um, we actually moved to Los Angeles for our little boys to have bone marrow transplants at UCLA. One of their sisters um, who did not have sickle cell disease, she was a, um, she could be a donor match. And so a 10 out of 10 donor match. So we came and we lived with a family for 477 days while our kids were receiving their treatment. And the family that we stayed with this is going back to your original question. <laughs> um, so for the family that we lived with during that time, um, so in Kenyan culture, uh, we ref I'm called Mama Ella because my firstborn daughter is named Ella. So the family we stayed with, we called them Baba and Mama Micah, and their son was a high school senior, and we called him and Micah. And so when we moved back to Kenya in 2019, God had already like put something within our team's heart um, for children in Kenya who have cancer diagnoses, doc diagnoses who are traveling from all over the country to receive their cancer treatment, um, but don't have a place to stay while they're getting it. So they, they may travel by public transportation eight hours to try to get help at the cancer center at the government hospital. They get chemotherapy by day and they don't have a place to sleep at night. And so we really had this burden of like, our hospital is a five minute drive. Could we create a place for them to come? And so that, that was kind of what we worked towards. And so in January of this year, we were able to open a 64 bed um, guest house called Micah's Guest House. And in the doorway, um, it has the verse, um, Micah 6, 8, which says, he has shown you what is good and what is required to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. And we feel like that's, if, you know, like if that can be our guide, that, you know, we will follow the ways of Jesus. <laughs> Every year, it seems like something is happening, like the Lord is doing something uh, in and through your team and your ministry. It's just an incredible thing. And, uh, you know, I'll never forget the first time that we met and talked. Um, you were telling me all that was going on and all that God was doing. And, and I, I said, how did you get involved in Living Room International? And you said, well, I founded it. <laughs> but it, with all humility, it's just incredible to see what God has done. And uh, you, you had, you've written a book, and recently uh, you wrote your second book, and it's coming out soon. It's called Brave Love. And when I think of even just that title, I feel like that describes what's happening uh, in you and Titus's life and the ministry that you've been a part of. And you were explaining it a little bit to me last night when I asked, you know, what, where did the title come from? Explain to me what your definition of brave love is. So I used to think of brave or bravery, courage, um, kind of like brave heart, you know, where it's like you're going into battle and there's no fear. And what I've learned over time um, with a lot of practice is that being brave is actually not about being unafraid, but it's a willingness to go into spaces where you might not feel comfortable and a, a willingness to stay there, a willingness like even when you might feel a little bit afraid or a lot of bit <laughs> afraid, um, that you're not alone, that God is with you, that you're doing it with community, and with that, that it gives you the courage um, to stay there and the compassion to keep looking when you might want to look away and when you might want to run, run out of the room, a willingness to stay in that space. And so, so it doesn't necessarily mean I have all of the intelligence, all of the manpower, all of the money, all my ducks in a row. It doesn't mean that. It means that you're willing. 
Yeah, it's a willingness, and I mean, it, it's a conviction that God is with us, that he's already in that space, and that it's not about me coming in and necessarily fixing what's broken, but am I willing to come into it and have eyes to see and ears to hear and a heart that will care? And, you know, there's the old um, world vision prayer that goes something like, God, break my heart for the things that break your heart. And I think there's something so powerful about that, but I don't believe that's the end of the prayer. I think it's then asking and then what? You know, like, I don't think that God breaks our hearts just for the sake of our brokenness. I feel like it's for a willingness to grow in compassion, a willingness to, to like, have him lead us in response. I know that for Natalie and I, when we were in full-time missions in Iowa, the Lord would ask us often to do scary things. And uh, our answer was generally yes, not without some in- intrepidation. It was always that yes, we're willing. And God, we, we actually called it hanging on to his coattails. Because he would be moving and doing these incredible things. And we would watch God, for example, like providing land. In, a, in something that seems totally impossible, but God is the God of the impossible. He does impossible things, and we see that all throughout his word, and we see it working in and through your ministry in, at Living Room. What are some ways that we can be praying for you, for your family, and for Living Room International? Well, we're grateful for prayer. We're grateful for people who are from literally all over the world who believe that this work matters, that believe that the people that we get to serve alongside, that they matter. Um, And so I think a prayer, an ongoing prayer is that as long as there's suffering, that God will give us the courage and the bravery to continue to to walk into those spaces um, and to have the compassion to do it, that we would have the wisdom to know um, how to interact with the larger ministry of health, how to continue to grow a team because we're ever growing. Like, how do we do it? Um, How do we do it so that as we expand services that we have the right people who are working with us, who are holding on to the vision that we have? How do we continue to love with the love of Jesus, um, with our words, with our actions, Um, with the decisions that we're making every day. For our family, I'd love continued prayers for our children's health and safety. Um, Our boys are cured of sickle cell disease, and we're so grateful for that. I mean, to be able to say that, like, it's really, it's been six years, but it is an incredible gift that I just, I don't even know exactly (laughs) how it happened, but we're so grateful. Um, But we do have a 14-year-old daughter who didn't have a donor match, and she still has sickle cell disease, and she's sick a lot. And so we'd love prayers for her and for our family as we navigate that. Um, And then we're just in a season of some transitions for our kids with schools and stuff as we, when we go back to Kenya, we just love prayer for our family as we navigate those that we would continue to listen for God's voice and we'd be able to recognize it and both in ministry as well as for our family. Awesome. You know, as we close our time, we have one more uh, short video about the Micah house. and I'd love to to play that video now if, uh, if Robin's got that up. The need for the guest house was evident to our team, to myself, before our family traveled 10,000 miles to Los Angeles for our boys to receive their bone marrow transplants and before a family so generously welcomed us. The people who come to stay in the guest house are the mothers who are traveling many miles. Chemo therapy in Eldred is majority's outpatient program. It was something that I thought at some point, like we need to we need to offer this to families that children could come from far distances who are undergoing cancer treatment at a nearby government hospital, but they need a place to stay. And currently they were sleeping on the floor of the government hospital in the corridors at night and then getting their chemotherapy in the day. And I just, as a mom who had slept beside my kids while they were receiving their chemotherapy, I just couldn't imagine that being um, okay. Though the guest house 
I, I don't know if most of them would have even completed the treatment because the journey is long, the frustrations are many, the financial constraints, and having a place to sleep, a warm space to sleep, to have their children away from the needles, from the hospital environment, away from the doctors, it makes even healing possible. Micah's guest house is located on our living room Eldred campus. It's about a five minute drive from the government hospital where these children are receiving their oncology services, their chemotherapy, their radiation therapy. The guest house has 64 beds in it, and so we're able to take care of a child plus a parent, or sometimes it's a sibling that accompanies the child, and they've traveled from all over the country um, many hours, and they need a place to stay. Almost every family that we serve in the guest house, they come from a low income background and we didn't want cost to be the prohibiting factor. We're offering the accommodation and the care that we provide to these families for free. It costs about $10 a day for the child and parent to stay with us for us to be able to feed and care for them. And we just feel like that's something we want to be able to offer them and for it not to be another burden for them to have to think about. They ask a lot of questions. Why? <laughs> Why me? Because majority of them, they think they don't deserve it. And we always say, all these have been done because somebody loves you and he cares for you. And when he, they hear that, for the first three or four days, they are watching him. Really, is this, is this us? Even when they are given a room, a mother and a child, that they are not sharing with anybody else, they are sharing as a family, and they receive a meal, they receive warm water to shower. You can hear the mother knowing that somebody is thinking about them and is loving about them. Now, we are giving children who are traveling for many miles uh, to get an opportunity to be there, to be served very early in the morning. We don't control whether these kids will survive, will be cured of their cancer, but we can make this season of treatment one where the families know that they aren't alone, know that they are seen and loved, and that's the opportunity that we feel like we have. Julie, thanks so much for being here this morning. I really appreciate it. Let's pray together. Father, what a privilege and an honor, a, a blessing to be a part of your work. Um, Lord, we, we can give of ourselves to other people. Um, and when we bring the gospel to bear, if we're not, uh, if we're just speaking, and we're not also acting upon the truth of the gospel, uh, it will fall on deaf ears. And I pray that you would help us to be convicted and do that work your way, the way that you did it, Jesus, by touching hearts and lives. Father, thank you for the Boyds. Thank you for Julie and her work, her team. God, we lift them up. I pray that you would provide for their needs, that you would give them exactly what they need to do your work your way. Father, I pray that uh, they would be able to press on knowing that you are going to guide their steps, that you will use their ministry to impact your kingdom. Thank you, Jesus, that when we were far away, when we were your enemies, you cared for us, and that you loved us when we were unlovable. Father, I pray that you would use Living Room International to touch the hearts of many lives, uh, that as you are healing bodies, that you would be healing hearts. Use them, God. I also pray for the Boyts, for their family. I pray for their eldest daughter, that you would heal her body. And God, thank you for the, the miraculous way that you can heal. You are the great physician, and we trust you. Lord, I pray that um, in their time here, that they'd be rejuvenated and rested and feel ready to go back to the, to the mission field. And Father, uh, that you would continue to use them in a powerful way to advance your kingdom. We love you, God. Thank you. 
for this time this morning that we get to hear about what you're doing. Pray these things in your precious and awesome name. Amen.